for everyone who's willing to do this. Um, don't do something that makes you feel uncomfortable, but for everyone who's willing to do this, as we turn to the sermon, please turn to your neighbor and please pray for me as I seek to share God's word. Everyone who's comfortable doing that, would you please take a moment and pray for me? Father, we all need you today. Your word is active and living and has the power to transform our very lives. Father, we need, we need to hear from you today. You've spoken to us this morning in the beauty of the sunrise. You've spoken to us, Father, as we've heard the prayers of others. You've spoken to our hearts, Father, as we've sung your praises. Father, as we look at your word, we pray, Father, that you may continue to speak. It's in your son's name we ask these things. Amen. Uh, Lynette, if you can stay on the next slide for just several moments, the next one. This one. For those of you that are joining us maybe for the first time, for several weeks, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. And each Sunday, we're looking at section by section as we go through Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, Lynette, let's just keep it on this slide for a moment. Uh, we're going today to focus on verses 13 through 16. But if you would allow me, and if you have your own copy of Scripture, you can please open this and see this as well. If you would allow me today just to go back and repeat, beginning with verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So if you have your own copy of Scripture today, please, let's just remind ourselves. The writer says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the first Sunday when we focused on those verses. We reminded ourselves that it is by faith that we understand the universe, how it was created, and life itself. And then we went into the next section. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And as we looked at those verses, we reminded ourselves that in the same way that Abel worshipped God, we should consider our worship in the same way that Enoch walked with the God, with the Lord, for 300 years. And the Bible says God was pleased with the way Enoch walked with him for 300 years. We need to be thinking about how we walk with the Lord 
And as there was work for Noah to do, as he built that ark, um, at a minimum, there's one scholar, and we reminded ourselves, there's one scholar that thinks the ark was built in 40 days. That's one opinion. The majority of scholars think it was at least 40 years, somewhere between 60 and perhaps 80 years. And our work, our life's work, what God has called us to do, whatever that is, if it's in the classroom, or if it's in the corporate headquarters, or if it's in the home, and if it's in the neighborhood, my work is my work reflecting my dependence upon God and following his teachings in my very life work. And then last week in verse 8, we looked at by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive and as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. Last week, we reminded ourselves of this simple truth. He obeyed and he went. God might send me across the hallway. God might send me to a different country. God might send you to a different person. He sends us in different directions, but we saw in Abraham and Sarah that by faith, they obeyed and they went. Okay, Lynette, thanks for helping me. Here's the question today. How long? How long? These are just averages, okay? If you're an average, healthy person, Okay, this is just an average. If you are an average, healthy person, you can hold your breath between 30 seconds and 90 seconds. You want to test it? You want to see how you want to see how average you are? Okay, but if you're just if you're just an average person, you can hold your breath between 30 seconds and a minute. Now, some extreme exertion, greatly trained people, they can go four or five, maybe even six minutes. But for, for those of us that are average. You can hold your breath from about 30 seconds to about no, a minute. <laughs> if you're an average healthy person, you can go without water for three days. These are just averages, okay? Not that you would want to, but if you were ever in a crisis, if you're just an average healthy person, you can go for three days without water. If you're an average healthy person, you can go for 40 days without food. Okay, this, you can, and some of you have done that. Some of you have experienced the 40-day fast, and you've gone through that process. Yep, you'll lose a lot of weight, but you can do it if you're just an average, healthy person. Today, though, let's think about how faithful we are. How long? How long will we remain faithful if we don't get what we want? If we don't see what we expect, if we don't receive what we're asking for, how long? Imagine that you and I were on an airplane ride, okay? And imagine that as we were seated, uh, the, the captain came over the announcement speaker and he says, Welcome, folks, to today's flight. We'll be flying at an altitude of 50,000 feet. Our estimated flight time is about 12 hours. We'll lean back and enjoy the ride. And so we settled into that airplane. <laughs> See, it's going to be a long 12 hour ride. And after he made the announcement, the, the pilot came out and we noticed very conspicuously that he had a parachute on his back. And we said, uh, Excuse me, sir, I can't help but notice you're our pilot and you happen to have a parachute on your back. And he goes, Yeah, I tell you what, I'm good for about two hours, but after that, I'm ready now. 
Whoa. I think I want a more faithful pilot for this 12 hour flight than you. Or imagine that there's this beautiful couple, they're standing before the minister, they're about to exchange their vows and sickness and in health for good or for bad. And the one turns to the other and says, You know what? I've been thinking about this. I think I can hang with you from that. I think about three years. You know, we want people to be more faithful than that, don't we? When, when the going gets tough, we, we don't want the pilot bailing out of the airplane. When things are getting hard, this person who said that they're going to stick with us through good and through bad, we, we don't want them disappearing. You know, but, but sadly, uh, I know a man. Uh, he was he was put in prison because he became a Christian. And as he was put in prison, his wife divorced him. Now, he, did you hear that? He was put in prison because he became a Christian. And since that was his charge, and since she didn't want to deal with the, the power that was in that country, she divorced him. I, I know another man. Uh, his wife had suffered from a stroke. And uh, she was literally in the hospital recovering from the stroke. And he was living with another woman. And he divorced her while she was in the hospital so that he could then go and marry the person that he was living with. We want more than that, don't we? When we talk about our practical life, we want, we want more than that. We want there to be more faithfulness than that. So please remember that the way we're looking at this is by section by section, okay? But please remember, last week we talked about Abraham and Sarah, okay? And next week we're going to talk about Abraham and Ken. So these verses that we're going to read, they're not just in isolation. It's like a continuous story, even though we're dividing it up today. Okay, but now the next we go to the focus for today's Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, those folks. Verse 13 says, these all died in faith. That's a very sobering statement. But at a minimum, We know people who start out in commitment. We know people who start out following God, but then something happens in their life and they die away from God. They're no longer following Him. Or they die in fear. Or they die in frustration. Today, it's a sobering topic, I know, but the day is going to come that I die. Would the people who love me say, he had his ups, he had his downs, but praise the Lord, we can say he died in faith. Having, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Now, when he was 75 years old, Abraham was told, you're going to have a child. Sarah was 65 years old, you're going to have a child. It was 25 years later, when Abraham was 100 years old, and when Sarah was 90 years old, that Isaac was actually born. So they had to be on this journey of their personal faith for at least 25 years. And even though God promised, and even though we know that God's promise was fulfilled, uh, someone in the prayer time today was just saying beautifully, thank you, Father, that we are sons of Abraham. Okay? And, and that spiritually is absolutely true. But when Abraham and Sarah died, they were just at the beginning. Am I communicating? Even though they had been following for 25 years, 
They were just at the beginning of God's promises being fulfilled. They didn't see as many children as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the, as the sand on the, on the beaches. They didn't see that. They weren't fully in the promised land. They were getting closer to that. They were taking steps towards that. But the very things that God had promised to them that we know were fulfilled are still being fulfilled. When they died, they didn't have the picture that you and I have been granted to have. We go on to verse um, 18. Excuse me, verse 14. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Some of the most powerful words in all of the English language. I, I truly would be interested to know what, what has the dynamic equivalent in your language that you grew up in your home, okay? These are some of the most powerful words that any native-born English speaker ever hears. You ready? These are some of the most powerful words. Come home. That goes to a native speaker heart in English, like no other phrase. Come on. My child, I've got this desire for you. Come home. They were seeking a homeland. They were seeking the place that the Father was leading them to. We continue in verse 15. If they had been thinking <clears throat> of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. Again, we mentioned last week in Genesis chapter 11, they had lived in this place called Haran. Once upon a time, they had started, the people had started a journey towards the promised land, but they stopped and they lived in Haran for a long time. But then in Genesis chapter 12, when God spoke to Abraham and said, I want you to leave this place and go where I'm telling you to go, they started to go. And as they started to go, they had the opportunity to go back. But they didn't. They kept going forward. Paul, um, at the end of his life in Philippians chapter 1, you can find in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul found that he had this personal dilemma going on in his life. Paul says, I, I'm ready to go and be with the Lord. I'm paraphrasing, I'm convinced. Please find Philippians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24 in your own Bible to be more accurate. I'm convinced. Paul says, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. I don't know what's better. Well, I do know what's better. It would be better if I was if I was released from this body and I went to be with the Lord, but it's better for you if I continue to stay. And, and, we, and we've come to those situations in our life, too, that we're in the midst of a situation, and we say, well, you know, for me personally, for me personally, it would be better if we just stop this right now. But for those that are around me, for those that I'm helping, it, it's better that I continue and that I persevere. We go to verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Staying in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. We all please check this out, make sure that it's accurate. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Again, as Paul continues on his journey of faith, he says, forgetting what is behind, I press on. My uh, my sister happens to still live in the house where I grew up. That, that's unusual. Um, I, I, most of us, our childhood homes, 
nobody in our family is still living here. But, but if I want to, I can literally still go back to America and I can still go to my childhood home. And, and when I show up, I mean this with humor, so please smile. And when I show up, there will always be something for me to do. Eddie, the handy man, is back. They, there will be hinges that are broken. There will be a faucet that needs a new washer. There will be uh, bushes that need to be trimmed. So if I ever go home, okay, uh, there's going to be work for me to do. And I can keep myself busy whenever I go home. And I can have all the great memories. But you know where I'm going with this. But in John chapter 14, Jesus said, I'm going away. And I'm preparing a place for you. And if I go away and I prepare that place for you, I'm going to come back and take you. So no matter how good my childhood home was and is, and it was a good childhood home, and it's still a good home where my sister lives. That, that's not the ultimate country that God's home is. That's, that's not the ultimate city. In Revelation, at the end of Revelation, John has this vision and saw a new heaven and a new earth and the new Jerusalem that was coming down. And the glory of God keeps that place illuminated so that there's not even the need for the sun and the moon and the stars. I'm going to a new city. I'm going to a new home. Now, now maybe you've had the same experience. Stick with me. Whenever I do go back to my home country, okay, there is a certain stretch of the highway that as I'm driving down that stretch of the highway, about uh, three miles, help me with the kilometers, five kilometers, about five kilometers in the distance, there's this ridge that I recognize. Because just beyond that ridge is my home. And I can see that ridge from about five kilometers. And I know that pretty soon I'm going to be home. There was a time in my life for 20 years that I flew a lot. And there was a holding pattern that I was in countless times in the airplane. And as I was in that holding pattern for 20 years of my life, that was a bad transition. You know what I'm coming to say. I wasn't in the airplane for 20 years. But during that time, as we as we as we were in this holding pattern, I would look out the window and I would say, yeah, it's, it's Moscow. I'm 50,000 feet in the air, but pretty soon I'm gonna be on the ground and I'm gonna be home with my wife and children. I'm not there yet, but I see it and I recognize it. Be there. You've got those memories in your own mind, even as I spoke. You can think about being on a specific road. You can picture it clear as day in your own mind. I say you should even picture it. Or you've been on those airplane flights, or you've been on that train ride, and you came around the bend, and you knew it's not very long, still a ways to go. I'm going to be home. So they did all these things because they desire a better, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, <laughs> one, one, of the great, one of the great phrases in all of scripture is this next phrase. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God is not ashamed. You know, like 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 every proud grandfather in the world, you know where this joke goes because every joke has a little bit of truth in it, you know. 
as a grandfather of nine of nine grandkids, you, you know what happens. Hey, do you want to see a picture of my grandkids? Not really, I didn't come to worship service. <laughs> but you know where this that one's mine. There could be thousands and thousands of grandkids in the world, but that one, that one's mine. And I'm not ashamed to call that one mine. And God says, there are thousands and thousands of people, but these people of faith, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and their descendants, I'm not ashamed, those are mine. They, they belong to me. And they were faithful to me, even when they didn't see the complete fulfillment of what I promised to them. So the next slide, just a, just a few bullet points on that. By faith, they saw <coughs> There was seeing in their lives with the eyes of faith. There was seeking in their lives as they went forward. They were not stopping in their walk, their journey of faith. And so the obvious question comes to me. What about me? Will I continue to see with the eyes of faith? Will I continue to seek with the heart of faith? Will I not stop? Will I continue to push forward? Our next slide, Lynette. There's this amazing story, and I'm so convincing everything today. You know it in the Old Testament. It's about Job. You know the story about Job. And it tells us that God is in heaven and, and he's getting a report from the earth. And it tells us, I'm, I'm simplifying the story, that Satan comes forward and Satan says, we out, there's some people down there and they follow you, but they only follow you because you give them good things. If you took away all the good things, they wouldn't follow you anymore. They're only doing it because it's good for them. And, and you know, in, in Job, God says, what about this one? What about Job? He worships me. Yes, but God, if you, if you took away all of his possessions, and it's mysterious, there's things about Job that are very disturbing. Just acknowledge that. Things that keep philosophers pondering to this day about the book of Job. But God, in his wisdom and providence, says, okay, Satan, Take the stuff away from him if you want to. And boom, all of his possessions are gone. And yet Job keeps worshiping God. Satan comes back and says, well, he took some of those things away from him. Well, his children, boom, are gone. Well, yeah, we, that was great. But if you did something against him personally, against his very body, and God says, okay, you can't kill him. But he inflicts him, he inflicts, Satan inflicts him with so much pain that finally his wife turns to him and says, You're you're inside, just curse God. And there will be mercy, and you can end this. Please stick with me. Most of the time, okay. There are the two great commandments we mentioned this earlier. I need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Okay? And I need to love others as I love myself. Okay? Most of the time, most of the time in my life and in your life, if things are going wrong, hear me clearly, most of the time is because one of those two things, something's not right. I'm not loving God as I should, and I'm not loving others as I should, and the problem that I'm experiencing most of the time comes back to one of those two issues. Most of the time. And in Job's situation, when his three friends showed up, 
They said, well, this is what's wrong, okay? You're either not worshiping God, there's some sin that we don't know about, and so just confess that sin. And Job says, to the best that makes me, to my hard hearts, I haven't, I haven't sinned against God. There's nothing that I can do that I need to confess. Well, then it's probably because you haven't been a good man to others. You withheld justice from widows and from poor people and from orphans. And, and Job says, I've given to people abundantly. And so in Job's situation, he was doing the very, very best that he knew how to do. And, and still, these afflictions came upon him. And he still believed in God. Even to the point of telling his spouse, do I only praise God and follow him when there are good things in my life? Shouldn't I also praise and follow him when there are bad things as well? What about this one? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul again says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation. Years, years and years ago, it's a very old song. There's uh, a song that includes it's called Satisfy Me, Jesus. It's an old, old hymn. I don't know if anybody even happened to know this old, old hymn. You'd have to be an American to even have a hint about this old, old hymn, okay? From my, from my childhood, from my teenage years, an old, old hymn that still comes to, to memory, written by a man named B.B. McKinney. And in the chorus, the song said, I am satisfied, I am satisfied. I am satisfied with Jesus, but the question comes to me as I think of Calvary, is my Savior satisfied with me? How long will you live the life of faith that God has called you to? And 